In this lecture in Climate and Earth 401, we're going to talk about how dynamics organizes the atmosphere. That is, how do the properties of fluids lead to the development of characteristic structures that we observe in the atmosphere and that we also very strongly associate with weather. In another lecture in the course, we talked about how the differential heating, the tilt of the Earth's axis, and how the rotation of the planet in the presence of mountains and the large masses of land and water would have a way to frame or to shape what the weather and climate looks like. And I think it's important, especially given some of the dialogue that we have today, to restate that weather and climate are really not occurring in random patterns and random features there are certain characteristics that are really quite strongly anchored to the basic structure of the planet and of course underlying fundamental physics. So we have a dynamic atmosphere and this first figure is a hurricane and this is a satellite image. I started with this because it's very familiar and often when I'm teaching this course is in the height of hurricane season, so there's a lot of interest and attention to hurricanes, but hurricanes are these types of features that are have these strong rotational flows like this, they're characterized by having an eye in it, and they're very neat features. They're a, they're a heat engine, they're one of the most direct thermodynamic heat engines that we ever see in, in the atmosphere. They originate over warm ocean water, and they have a characteristic scale of motion that's really fairly small. It's hundreds of kilometers. They have a characteristic lifetime of, of weeks, small number of weeks. You, know, you don't see a hurricane hanging around even for a month. We talk about hurricanes, generally the one to two to three week time span at which time what usually happens to them is that they move into from tropical to subtropical to middle latitudes and then they get taken up by other dynamical features which then carry that energy and that moisture up towards the pole. So here's the planet. I started out with the hurricanes but now I'm going to step back to the planet because if we look at the planet and start to think about it from the point of view of dynamics there's a lot you can see just going on here. This image shows the planet. So we're, this is Africa. So it's centered on Africa. This is Saudi Arabia here. This is the Southern Ocean. This is Antarctica. Here in the Southern Hemisphere, you see these curving motions that we might associate with middle latitudes. And then we move up towards the tropics, so this would be the equatorial regions, and we see these sort of clumpy clouds that are associated with the tropical regions where you don't see these large swirling curving motions like this. And then in this figure where we have here the Sahara Desert, we see an, an area with really almost no cloud. And all of these things are characteristic of atmospheric motions and atmospheric dynamics. So you can just look at the planet here and you can see organization into different sorts of dynamical features and features that are characteristic of both the weather and indeed the climate. The first figure I showed was a hurricane. The weather that might be said to at some level dominate North America and the continental United States are extra tropical storm systems and what are often called mid-latitude storms. And this is a satellite image of a storm system in the Gulf of Alaska. You can see this system as you can see the hurricane because of the presence of the cloud and the, and the water vapor which allows you to see some sort of proxy of the motion. And again, like the hurricane, you see this swirling motion into what's really a low pressure system. You see what is wrapping up here. Distinct from the hurricane, you don't really see an eye forming here. And the dynamics associated with these mid-latitude systems 
which are very strongly associated with winter storms, the dynamics of this event are quite different than those of the hurricane. And here's another view of a mid-latitude storm, and this is twin storms near Iceland and Scotland, and you can see that unlike hurricanes, which are usually isolated events, you might have families of these mid-latitude storms. And you can start to see in this figure, if you look here through this part here, you start to get this idea of a wave of some sort. And you can almost imagine this as, as a breaking wave. You know, here's a wave and then here's this curling up. And that's an analog that is descriptively useful and also offers some potential theoretical ways of, of looking at these events. If we look at the scale of these mid-latitude cyclones, then we're looking at something that's quite a bit larger than a hurricane, which was hundreds of kilometers. These are starting to become thousands of kilometers. Going the other direction to something that's much smaller and also really very familiar to people is the idea of a thunderstorm. And a thunderstorm is, is something that is going to occur with a horizontal scale of kilometers, just a small number of kilometers. The vertical scale might be the depth of the entire troposphere, and the vertical motions in thunderstorms might be very fast. And these are driven generally by surface heating that causes hot air to form at the surface, and as we know generally, hot air rises, and when it rises, it can release some of the water vapor associated with it, and so we get these thunderstorms, which are what we call convection, convective storms in our field of meteorology, and it's a little bit like you could almost think of them as, as boiling water, where you have a hot surface and you start getting things to, I'll say, quote, bubble up. Now, thunderstorms are interesting. They are often very important weather features in the summer in the United States because they're associated with extreme rain and extreme wind. And thunderstorms can group or they can organize. They can organize into something called mesoscale convective complexes, which occurs virtually every day somewhere in the United States during the summer. A particular type of mesoscale convective complex that we've heard more about in the last four or five years is this idea of a derecho, which is a straight line windstorm. If we look at larger scales, Things like the Madden-Julian Oscillation, which is a phenomenon that occurs in the tropics but that has impacts on middle latitudes, can be viewed as organized clusters of thunderstorms that organize, hold together, and, and propagate. And indeed, given the important roles of convection in a hurricane, you can view that hurricanes are a special type of organization of thunderstorms. And then we have what I'll call the supercell, which is an often dangerous convective storm that consists primarily of a single quasi-steady rotating updraft. So we've introduced the idea that not only do we have this idea of the, the boiling of the convection of the hot air rising, but that it's rotating and these types of storms persist for a long time and because of that they can become very dangerous. Supercells are the source of one of the most exciting weather phenomenon which is the tornado. These are very intense vortices that are generally associated with these supercells and of course they are the source of some of the most extreme weather that we experience, especially in very localized and very small locations. Again, the scale of the motion here is now tens of kilometers down to one kilometer, and even you could argue something you know less than a kilometer. So these phenomena are quite small compared to 
the mid-latitude cyclones or to hurricanes. But when we start to see them, like in hurricanes, we often see some tornadoes um, embedded within hurricanes after they reach land. So you can see that these different types of phenomena, these different features uh, are present there, but almost always you will see a collection of features like this as opposed to what we might just call random and unorganized weather or phenomena. And then there are other phenomena that are perhaps even smaller scales, dust devils, which you can see generally as spinning small features close to the ground. And you can again see them because in this case, they don't necessarily have water in them. They've sucked up some dust so you can see them. And these are caused by a combination of the hot surface and having some wind blowing over it and starting to twist it. And they have a combination of some vertical motion and some rotation and you get these little dust devils. Something that you often see, especially in the winter, are these small scale waves in the atmosphere, very high up in the troposphere, that are gravity waves. And they're a little bit more like an, an ocean wave where you see a wave on top of the ocean than some of these other waves that we've introduced. And these are often very beautiful. You see them associated with fronts in the winter times. You see them coming over mountains. And they're often considered not to be especially important to meteorology and weather forecasting. However, they are a very important part of the dynamical system of the atmosphere. And then if you're flying an airplane, they're very important to things like turbulence. You cannot just say because these waves are small that they are not of interest to the meteorologists and to the weather and to its applications. So I also want to bring into the discussion of, the, of what the winds do to the ocean. The surface circulation of the ocean is largely wind-driven. And what's shown in this graph here, this plot, is the surface wind stress and this idea that the wind uh, air fluid flowing over the water fluid it makes these waves and it, and it ends up with all these little circulations and this turbulence associated with it which essentially is a stress that pushes the ocean water on average in the direction of the wind and it affects a relatively shallow part of the ocean but it accumulates over time. Again, this idea that there's an accumulative effect of, of the weather. And, and so it starts to, to push the, the water in one direction or the other. And this average uh, surface wind stress figure here, you see the, the arrows here that are sort of pointing here from here from east to west, here from west to east, um, here from west to east and you can see this idea of some sort of average stress that the atmosphere places on the ocean and then it leads to something that looks like this which are surface currents in the ocean where you have the Gulf Stream here you have a warm current here you have the Kuroshio uh, warm current here you have returning cold so you have this idea in general in the northern hemisphere of moving warm water to the north and in the southern hemisphere moving warm water to the south. So you can see that the ocean and the winds are working together here to smooth out these temperature gradients that are caused by the heating. You see the necessary return flow of bringing cooler water back into the warmer regions. And you have this characteristic that is really quite interesting that these major currents are occurring on the western side of the oceanic basins. And this is not just coincidence. This is something that is coming from the basic rotation of the Earth. When you think about this even more broadly, 
the same sort of phenomena, the same sort of physics we would expect to be at work on other planets or the moons of other planets, such as the moons of the giant planets of Jupiter and Saturn in particular, where you can look at this and again see these sort of fluid dynamical features and then Jupiter's great red spot. And here's a somewhat longer discussion of that, which is generally interpreted as a persistent long-term storm that has been on Jupiter as long as we've observed it. And something like that can occur perhaps on a planet like Jupiter because it does not have that surface, that land surface, those mountains and that trees that cause the friction that we see on Earth, which would cause such a storm to dissipate. So with that, what I would like to convey is that dynamics and these fluid dynamical features that are related to the rotation and the curvature of the Earth and the differential heating and the different physics that cause these sorts of features really end up organizing the atmosphere. And by doing that organization, it makes it more tractable to study it and it also makes it something that we have the chance of doing meaningful simulations that lead to predictions that we use as guidance in weather forecasting.